Welcome to Crete, everyone. I'm here on holiday right now, which means I should be sitting on the beach, sipping gin tonics and getting sunburned. But then I couldn't tell you about the most groundbreaking Java release in recent years and probably for years to come. Indeed I am. And thanks for asking, Billy. Oh, uh, I should probably mention that while I'm here in paradise talking to you about Java, Billy is stuck in Kansas, sitting in his room, grumpily editing this episode. Say hi, Billy. Ha, <laughs> funny man. Anyway, JDK 19 has been forked last week, so let's go over what code you can write that you couldn't write before and why this makes for such a monumental release. Let me know in the comments whether you agree. There's lots more to talk about for all of these features, so I'll put plenty of links in the description. Ready? Then let's dive right in. If you like pina coladas. With the modernized switch, type patterns as the first instance of patterns, and seal classes in place, Java 19 makes headway on putting them together, using patterns in switch. This takes a bit more time to shake out all the details and is currently in the third preview. A few noteworthy aspects. Exhaustiveness is not only checked for switch expressions, but also for switch statements if they use patterns. If the switch variable is null, a null pointer exception will be thrown unless a case null handles it. While using patterns is nice, it doesn't capture all checks you may want to apply to an instance, and so when clauses allow you to add additional Boolean expressions to refine cases. This is not just about type patterns, but more generally all kinds of patterns in switch. More patterns introduced in the future will just work in switches. So Java 19 is doing all the right things, like the new requirement of case null for null handling. And I feel it in my old bones, I don't think there'll be a fourth preview. And while finalizing this proposal won't be the end of Java's evolution in this space, it will be an important milestone. We'll finally have all the pieces we need to start using pattern matching in our daily work. In anger, as the Brits say. And it also frees up Project Amber for other work. For example, on record patterns. Inspecting an instance's type is nice and all, but sometimes you need to reach deep in and special case the order where the buyer is an employee and not a customer, or where the order amount is above a certain threshold. Record patterns let you do all that easily and declaratively by taking apart a record into its constituent components. Ah, remember that records are all about transparency, so if you want to encapsulate your data, they're not the right choice anyway. So when applying an instance of check in an if or switch over an instance, you can write what looks like the record's canonical constructor to declare variables and assign them the component's values in one go. You don't actually have to use the same names though. Components are identified by their position and you can give the variables any name you want. And you don't have to use their types either. You can use var to have it inferred or use a subtype to only match those instances whose components has that exact type. This way you can, for example, easily special case orders whose buyer is an employee. All of this is very exciting, not only because it's going to be very handy for handling simple data and it's another step to records as full-blown algebraic data types, this preview is also testament to Project Amber's shift towards introducing more patterns, deconstruction for records, maybe for classes, possibly for destructuring on assignment, we may get custom patterns. So many thrilling options and JDK 19 is taking the first step. I'm no native code guy, in fact I can't even write C or C++. So I'm not going to embarrass myself talking about things that I don't understand. Instead, I'm going to show you a code snippet of the foreign function memory API that sorts a string array with the C library function Redix sort. And I'm going to let Billy talk you through it. <clears throat> well, this is unexpected. Okay, so first you want to find the foreign function, in this case, Redix sort on the C library path. Next, you'll allocate on heap memory to store the strings. Then you'll allocate off heap memory to store an equivalent number of pointers copy these strings from on heap to off heap. Thank you, Billy. Hold on, Nikolai, I'm not done yet. Freezing you in an embarrassing frame, good. Okay, so you'll want to then sort the off heap data by calling the foreign function radix sort, and last, copy the new reordered strings from off heap to on heap. Okay, back to you, Nikolai. The APIs have been incubating independently for a few releases and have seen some revamps during that time, but Java 19 probably puts an end to that. It ships them as a preview in their final package, and no major changes are foreseeable. Another milestone, this time from Project Panama, achieved by 19. Another crucial ingredient is J-Extract, which recently became a standalone project to be evolved more rapidly than the JDK release cadence would allow. There's a link to the GitHub in the description. Plenty has been said about Project Loom's virtual threads, most recently in the latest Jeb Cafe that I highly recommend you check out. So I'll keep this super short. 
In all ways that matter, virtual threads behave like platform threads, but are cheap enough that you can have millions and millions more. This gives you the scalability of asynchronous programming models with the simplicity of synchronous code. It can't possibly be that simple? Well, not quite, but almost. As I said in the intro, check out the linked sources for more. Your interaction with virtual threads will likely be very indirect. While there is a new Thread Builder API and new methods Thread of Virtual and Thread Start Virtual Thread Runnable, you probably won't use them very often. A good way to start multiple virtual threads is with the executor that uses a virtual thread per task. And I'll come to an even better way in a minute. But most threads in your app will likely not be created by you, but by your web server, and will hopefully get an option soon to spawn a virtual thread instead of a platform thread for each request, so your code runs in virtual threads by default. All of this is truly groundbreaking, and Java 19 will always be remembered as the release that first preview project looms core. But they're not done yet. Java 19 isn't, Loom isn't, even Java 19 on Loom isn't. Loom's other big play is introducing structured concurrency to Java. Its principle is that if a task splits into concurrent subtasks, they all return to the task's code block. Consequently, the lifetimes of all concurrent subtasks are confined to a single syntactic block, which means they can be reasoned about and managed as a unit. To that end, the parent task creates a new scope, decides on the error handling it needs, spawns the subtasks, and then awaits their completion. It can process any errors that occurred, or, if all went well, compose the subtask's result to its result. Nesting subtasks in a parent's block induces a hierarchy that can be represented at runtime when structured concurrency builds a tree-shaped hierarchy of tasks. This tree is the concurrent counterpart to a single thread's call stack, and tools can use it to present subtasks as children of their parents' tasks. That means your IDE has all the information it needs to let you navigate from any subtask deep in the bowels of your system to parents and their parents all the way up to the outermost task, for example, the WEC request that spawned the entire computation. Virtual threads and structured concurrency are together go like, like, yes, thank you. Virtual threads deliver an abundance of threads, and structured concurrency ensures that they are correctly and robustly coordinated. Thanks to that, observability tools will see threads organized in the logical manner intended by the developer. And all of that in Java 19, even, even if just as a preview. Uh, uh, look, I know I promised you an introduction to the Vector API, but today is not a good day for that. I'm running out of time and I really want to get back to those syntonics that I mentioned. And, oh. Mm. Well, I guess that covers that. OK, let's make it quick and do something deeper in the future. In arithmetic-heavy areas, like image processing or machine learning, it's common to have loops that execute the same computation on elements of one or more arrays. As a simple example, say you have two arrays A and B of equal length, and you want to uh, pairwise add the elements. Then the CPU might execute instructions that boil down to load element from A into a register, load an element from B into a register, add the registers, and write the result to C. Or it might load 16 elements from A into a multi-word register, load 16 elements from B into another multi-word register, add the registers, and write those 16 results out to C. Both instruction sets take about the same time, but the second version, which uses the CPU's vector extension, computes 16 results instead of one. That's a 16-fold speedup. Which one of these instructions it's going to be depends on whether the just-in-time compiler and auto-vectorizer can figure out what to do with your loop, and while it's great when it does that, it doesn't do it reliably. The Vector API, on the other hand, lets you write computations that reliably translate to optimal machine instructions. It requires a bit more code and a different approach, though. First, you create a so-called vector species, which, among other things, has a length that's the actual multi-word register length, which is different on different CPUs, divided by the length of the data type you want to use, double or float, for example. The 16 earlier was just an example. It could just as well be 4, 64, or something else. Then you write a loop that takes steps of that length so that in each iteration you load that many elements from the arrays into vectors, do the computation big integer style calling methods on them, and then write the resulting vector to the result array. At runtime, the just-in-time compiler will create machine code specifically for the CPU that executes this, thus guaranteeing optimal performance on all platforms. Neat, huh? While JDK 19 further improves the Vector API, it doesn't take the big step to bring it out of incubation. It's waiting for Project Valhalla's improvement because they will change the API 
It would be sad to finalize it now and then in a few years be stuck with a version that could be better but can't be changed anymore. Speaking of Valhalla, can you imagine how amazing it would be if it also previewed something in 19? In fact, the release that contains those changes is the only one I can imagine to be more groundbreaking than JDK 19. What do you think? Would it be better than this one with all that Loom, Amber and Panama goodness? Let me know in the comments. And that's it from Crete. I hope you're looking forward to JDK 19 just as much as I do. Don't forget to like and share this video with your friends and enemies. I'll see you again in two weeks. So long!